Uh, so I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, we're about to have an interactive session with Sophia Erickson from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and Dave Green from Clear Horizons, facilitated by myself, Kim Vesley, with Zoom support from Robert Grimshaw as co-conveners of the Australian Evaluation Society's Queensland Regional Committee. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, the Yuggera people and the Turbul people as the sorry, as the traditional custodians of Mianjin, the lands on which myself and Robert work, but also to the also, to representing the land on which Dave and Sophia work. And I pay my respects to elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. This session will explore the role of DFAT standards that they have played in efforts to improve the quality on, and use of monitoring, evaluation and learning in the Australian Development Program over the last decade. The session will explain how the standards came about, how they are used on a day-to-day -day basis and their strengths and limitations as a tool for evaluation capacity building. The Australian government's new international development policy, performance and delivery framework commits to continued improvements in monitoring, evaluation and learning practice underpinned by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trades, Design and Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning, MEL standards. The standards set details and expectations for key products in the program cycle, such as theories of change, MEL plans and systems, and evaluation terms of reference, plans and reports. First, we welcome Sophia Erickson, who is the MEL advisor in DFAT. Sophia has worked in international development for 30 years and for the last decade has focused on monitoring, evaluation and learning. She, is, she has worked for both Australia and Sweden's bilateral development agencies at headquarters and on postings including China and Papua New Guinea. Sophia was an integral part of the Evaluation Capacity Building Program delivered to staff in Indonesia uh, this program developed and piloted the design and MEL standards that are still used today. Most recently, she was involved in the refresh of the standards and is now building up internal DFAT capacity to use them. Sophia is passionate about getting staff involved in the use of MEL. Next, we welcome Dave Green, who is a lead principal consultant at Clear Horizons. Dave has worked on Australia's aid program in the Pacific and Southeast Asia, for over 15 years across the public, not-for-profit and private sectors. And he has a deep understanding of DFAT approaches to aid design and delivery. His experience spans investment design, monitoring and evaluation experience across diverse sectors, including education, WASH, health, governance, community-driven development, aid, uh, sorry, civil society strengthening, impact investing, gender-based violence and, and at the country portfolio level, he has developed strategies, uh, MEL systems and performance reports, as well as driven systematic efforts to institutionalize portfolio-wide MEL capacity. Dave is passionate about improving international development practice by providing credible and useful insights to policymakers and practitioners. Before we get started, just a note on housekeeping. You can post questions to the chat box. We will respond to intermittently at the end of each uh, presentation. All other questions will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation during Q&A. Please stay muted as necessary unless you're asking a question. Please keep cameras off if not asking a question. And lastly, please advise us who you would like to respond to your question. This session will be recorded and uploaded to the AES YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Today's session will start with Sophia. Before moving to Dave, over to you, Sophia. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in this session. Both Dave and I are really excited to talk about this subject, as you might have gathered from the introduction. And first, I also would like to acknowledge the Noongarwal people whose land uh, Dave and I are meeting you from and pay my respect to the elders past and present, as well as acknowledge, acknowledging any First Nations peoples on 
in this um, presentation. So, uh, Robert, if you could have the next slide, please. So I just wanted to set the scene a little bit because uh, if you are involved in the development uh, sphere, you will be aware that we now have a new international development policy launched a couple of weeks ago. And that policy makes a number of commitments around increasing monitoring and evaluation and learning uh, across the development uh, in program. And uh, it's, it's very exciting because, of course, we have been doing this for a long time, but this policy is, uh, uh, I think, increasing the ambition on, uh, on MEL. And uh, I have a favorite quote already. Effective monitoring, evaluation and learning are critical to achieving results and ensuring our programs continue to innovate, improve and reflect best practice. So for us, it's very exciting to see words like that in the policy. Uh, next slide, please. And these commitments, I think, are there because uh, not just because we need a more MEL in international development, but it is also in the context of the government wanting to increase uh, evaluation skills and use across the Australian public service. So in this group, you will be aware of the 10 million over four years commitment to set up um, an Australian Centre for Evaluation in Treasury. And, and this is also reflected in, uh, in DFAT, of course. So I think we are very fortunate in the international development sphere because we have worked on this and focused, even though we can always get better. Uh, but there's also more interest across other areas of DFAT, uh, like our uh, foreign policy, trade and passports. Passports have been doing monitoring and evaluation for a long time. You might have seen during COVID when the, it was, uh, they were a bit hammered and in Senate estimates, they would have uh, talked about how they monitored and dealt with those issues. We also have a lot of internal, uh, we, there was an OD Office of Development Effectiveness Evaluation uh, published in 2018 that looked at contractors monitoring and evaluation systems and uh, the findings there were that we can become a lot better. Next slide, please. So also, uh, just to set the scene a little bit, uh, is that when we look at uh, performance reporting, it's different levels from the international development sphere. So the policy has a performance assessment framework. Uh, it's available online on, on DFAT's website, which has uh, determined, I think it's 32 indicators that uh, uh, investments are reporting towards. Uh, we are also developing, it's starting now to develop, um, let me get the name right, development partnership plans, which is so, uh, sort of like a country strategy, what we want to achieve in each country and also regional programs. These will also have their specific performance frameworks. Uh, we do uh, investment progress reporting which is annual self-assessments. And all of these reportings rely on good MEL systems at the investment level. I would say 90% of the information to feed into these overarching systems would be coming from uh, individual MEL systems. And I should also say that in DFAT, we, uh, as a DFAT uh, investment manager, the role of us in terms of uh, MEL is to buy quality assure and use MEL. It's uh, contractors that deliver both MEL systems and reporting. And also uh, when we do independent evaluations, it's done by uh, contracted in evaluation specialists. Uh, 
So I'm going to hand over to one of them, which is Dave, to talk a little bit about what happens at the investment level. Over to you, Dave. Thanks, Sophia. And hi, everyone. Um, yeah, it's just a, a quick note, I guess, for those who haven't worked in international development, the um, and I'm still really getting my, my head around the difference between how this works domestically versus internationally uh, for Australia and for Australian evaluators. But um, the bottom line is that most of the, as Sophia said, most of the MEL um, uh, expertise and the MEL resources sit at the investment level. So at that country program level, it's it's really mostly just um, uh, monitoring a set of performance indicators. It doesn't usually go much further beyond that. But at the investment level, there's a quite a, um, you know, as, as shown in the standards, there's a, a fairly expectation of a fairly comprehensive approach incorporating monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And the resources and the expertise to do those things usually sit within a DFAT implementing partner. So, you know, that could be a contractor or it could be uh, a multilateral partner or an NGO. Um, and and that, that team of MEL people may sometimes be commissioning uh, evaluation work or uh, they might be doing that themselves, um, but they'll also have a, a pretty heavy load of, of monitoring and, and learning and reporting work to do. Um, and then, as Sophia said, there are independent evaluations that are commissioned by DFAT directly. But I think compared to domestically, I would say that those evaluations are generally um, shorter and you know have smaller budgets than than you would see in some sectors domestically. So hopefully, that just gives you a bit of a picture for those who are new to international development of how how um, the space is kind of resourced. Back to you, Sophia. Thank you. And uh, I also just wanted to point out that, uh, as you see, the last bullet point, because one of the things also in the new uh, uh, development policy is uh, an increased focus on accountability and transparency. And of course, that also uh, is good news for us that are interested in MEL, because the information uh, stems from all our MEL systems. So it, it's... Uh, all exciting news. Next slide, please. So what we wanted to do uh, also is to give you a little bit of history, because when we talk about building uh, capability, capabilities inside organizations, so this work, I think, started 15 years plus ago, uh, and it was sort of within uh, Indonesia program. So it wasn't sort of at the corporate level of DFAT. And we wanted to see how we could build up the capability of the staff within uh, that area, because at that time, this was, uh, I think, the largest uh, program that Australia funded overseas. And what was needed to do this was definitely to have mandate from senior management that they were really interested in performance and performance uh, data and uh, gave space for people to build their capability. And then what is also needed is uh, the right expertise because I, I mentioned earlier that uh, all the MEL expertise is really sits outside of DFAT. So our role within DFAT is to identify by a quality sure and use it. And in our case, we were really lucky because we had uh, Dr. Sue Dawson, who had already worked on uh, with OSAID and DFAT and uh, worked on evaluations and supporting MEL systems and really investigated what was not working well and how that could be improved. I was extremely lucky because I came back from a posting and uh, slotted into this severe uh, because it is really important to have someone inside the organization that can uh, network and see what's going on, use the political economic sort of uh, who is your with you and who is needs to be nudged to work with you. 
and also to uh, checking in on the mandate, so it's still there. Uh, and then the final thing that we uh, definitely discovered is this systematic approach that needs to be there because a lot of uh, organizations that I've been involved in, it's uh, you do a lot of training on uh, ME, but you don't really see any changes in terms of uh, capability. So in this case, when we talked about a systematic approach, it was in the early days, we didn't obviously have the standard. So it was working through templates and uh, supporting people, having help desks. It was coaching and training uh, on the job. So more looking at what people actually needed to be trained in, in relationship to the job rather than two years before they were going to do uh, an evaluation, for example. And in this work, it uh, over time, uh, Sue Dawson uh, looked at internationally, looked at standards. The Canadians were ahead on this and came up and wrote the standards that we have built on since then. And it was really appreciated by uh, staff and um, uh, and also our, even though we didn't focus on the implementing partners, uh, male people that worked within those organizations also really liked having the standards because it sort of, we'll talk more about it later, but it sort of made it easier to have a framework that people could agree around. I think that is what needs to be said about history, but I could ask Dave because he was actually part of this history before he ventured out of DFAT. Is there anything you want to add here, Dave, that I've forgotten? Um, yeah, so I, I used to work for AusAid um, at the time and I was on the Timor Leste program. And so um, Timor, along with some other countries, I think Vanuatu and maybe one or two others, um, replicated or adapted this idea of an evaluation capacity building program that Indonesia had, was implementing to other country programs. So it was a real sort of, you know, diffusion of this, this idea across various, um, at, at the program level, you know, within AusAid. Uh, and it was multifaceted. So, you know, in addition to what Sophia was saying, there was also a, a, um, usually a, uh, a, an effort to build in-house capability to deliver some of the training, for example, that um, that Sue Dawson was delivering at the time. So it was a pretty comprehensive approach. It was picked up to some degree by different country programs, but then yeah, organizationally, AusAid um, adopted the standards, but not the ECB program. So, but obviously the standards were a critical component. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, that, that is a, a very good point. Uh, so next slide, please. So the design and mail standards that we are now using, they were refreshed. So it, not new standards and then uh, published in December 2022, which was uh, quite timely because it was 10 years after they were first published. And I had actually been away for about seven years overseas. So coming back, uh, so I left when also it existed and came back to DFAT. So I was extremely pleased to see that the standards were still there, even though ECB was not uh, implemented as it had been. Uh, with these standards that we have now, we have added some standards around uh, concepts, which is a, a tool that DFAT is using to make a case for some uh, programs that we want to implement in, in countries. And then that concept is made into a design. And we also have a standard on program logic. Uh, and in DFAT, we sort of talk about program logic slash theory of change. We do not differentiate between these uh, terms like others might. So the good thing for us to have a standard is because of, as all of you know, the terminology in uh, 
mail can become quite difficult to, as, especially when you work overseas also. So at least we are trying to have a, a terminology that is consistent within DFAT and with our uh, implementing partners that are contractors. Uh, but it, it's still a work in progress. Uh, we really emphasize that this is not a checklist and I will come back to that uh, a bit later in this uh, presentation. And we also try to focus on that mail systems are user focused. Uh, the, everything we talk about today, Dave and I are work in progress because it requires a lot of behavior change on all parts, but it's no point uh, creating mail systems that are too complex and complicated and uh, and then not very user friendly so people don't use the information for decision making. Uh, when we refreshed the standards we um, had what we we call a brains trust so we invited some of our mail experts that work regularly with DFAT uh, I was lucky because I had just returned, so I could sort of provide, which is quite unusual, but I could provide the corporate history here. And we also had some of our local staff that had been involved uh, in the previous years to uh, participate. And uh, that's then what became these refreshed standards. Next slide, please. So this is uh, what it looks like. You can find these standards on the DFAT internet. So the highlighted in yellow are the new standards. And then from five to 10 are refreshed from the previous versions. And the good thing for us now is that the standards actually cover the whole program cycle. Uh, and it has been also, a, it's a bit, clearer in terms of MEL where what the expectations are at different stages. So that there are certain expectations for MEL at the sign stage and then uh, at uh, six months we have we expect a plan which is basically a paper product and then at 12 months, that plan has been operationalized, and which we then call that it's become a system. Uh, and as you see also, standard eight to 10 is focused on evaluations. So <clears throat> number eight, which is about terms of reference, that's ve very much an internal that DFAT needs to be in charge of writing the terms of reference. We know what questions we want to ask. And then uh, nine and 10 is to uh, be able to assure quality and discuss with our evaluators what the expectations are. Next slide, please. I just wanted to go through a little bit on, so as Dave said, we do not have right now, it might come on board again now when uh, the new policy has a bigger focus again on uh, uh, MEL, but we do not have a formal evaluation capacity building program. Uh, but what I'm trying to do in my humble little way is to try to replicate a little bit of what we did uh, over 15 years ago. So what I emphasize to staff within DFAT is that the standards have been in place for a long time, so it's not something new. Uh, I know that uh, our contractors have used them and uh, male experts have used them over all these years, really emphasizing that it's not a checklist uh, because this is a, a tool that um, we really want to encourage dialogue and discussions around uh, the standards. It's also not something someone else does for you because what is uh, could very easily and has happened is that uh, a staff member gets a mail plan. They send it off to another expert to check the quality and they get back the quality assurance. Then they send it off to the contractor and the contractor responds and then the mail plan doesn't really become more than a 
paper product. So it's really important. One of my sort of indicators is when people engage with me to talk about the plans rather than having the absolute perfect plan. I'm happiest when, when I get people calling me up. And the other thing that I do talk to people about is that to get good mail systems actually working and producing uh, credible information that uh, we make decisions on requires behavior change. It requires behavior change within DFAT with all our investment managers to really engage with the mail system uh, and use the information and discuss it with partners. But it also will require change on uh, our implementing partner side because uh, it's um, if, if we haven't demanded uh, in a consistent way what we want, then it's very difficult for contractors to respond and uh, not to be mean, but sometimes they also are in old habits and uh, respond in a way that they've always done, uh, which has not been the best uh, mail systems in uh, that we would have liked to see. Uh, it is included in all contracts. So these are implementing partners that are contractors. Uh, they have in the contracts that they have to apply the standards. And what is going to be uh, a little bit new for people is that with the new policy in the performance framework, we have something that we call tier three indicators, which are indicators that assess ourselves and how we work. And we are going to have one of those, which is that the MEL plan is assessed against the standards. And I'll go through a little bit what that uh, might entail from my, my end. And we have said that we want to see MEL plans at around six months. And this is also to uh, encourage that this doesn't slip away. Because in my uh, all the years that I've worked on uh, uh, with in both OSAID and DFAT, it's very easy that the MEL plan does not get done and then it's, it starts slipping and then you're halfway through the program before it's an agreed system that is actually in place. So this is also something that is in that behavior change box that we want to see this move in a more reasonable way than uh, it has been up until now. And, and finally, what I also really emphasize uh, is that this having the standards and it's not a checklist it's a really important to have a dialogue and create a partnership because with the, without the implementers we have no information whatsoever since it's all done by uh, our partners so it's really really important to uh, have a very good dialogue and uh, create that trust uh, with each other. Also, because if you have that trust, you can tell people when it's not going so well and actually learn from that. So I'll go through a little bit, next slide. And apologies, because this is very small text, but it's just to give you a little bit of an idea what uh, an assessment of a mail plan that I do can look like. So here you sort of have the upper part of uh, the standard, standard five uh, of the plan. Next slide, please. And then uh, I've created uh, this little tool for the plan. So basically just added a box underneath each element, uh, which includes if a standard has been met, partially met, mostly met, not met, or not clear. And this might sound like a lot, but what I discovered when I started pilot the standards is that to be able to create a dialogue, you actually have to differentiate 
a little bit on what you are assessing. Uh, because if you go hardcore and say that nothing is met, which could happen, then of course it will be very difficult to start uh, a relationship and partnership. Uh, so from my horizon, it's better to have uh, possibilities to differentiate a little bit broader on when things are mostly met or partially met, for example. The not clear is also very good for uh, staff that are starting out on this because these standards should be possible to use by non-technical people. And of course, some of it is more technical than other parts of it. But if you uh, use not clear, then you can have a dialogue and the, your implementing party can then explain to you uh, what is happening and make it clearer. And, and I also have uh, many instances when I have to put not clear. So it's, uh, it's a good thing to have there. Next slide, please. So again, apologies, it's just to give you a little bit of a sense. So this is sort of what it can look like when the assessment is done. So uh, hopefully you can see a little bit that you have uh, partially met and met. And then also the important thing here is that you have to articulate how it can be strengthened or improved. Because this is something in my uh, experience in DFAT is that it's very easy to say I'm not happy, but then not that easy to say how are the partner going to do better uh, and so that we, we are satisfied, both of us. So that's a little bit what it can look like. And then next slide, please. And this is an ideal situation, which uh, as an advisor, you rarely get to because you send off your advice and uh, often don't hear back again. But I use this, uh, this particular investment as a, a pilot. So I talked to all the, the partners that I was wanting to use it as a, one of the first pilots. And in this case, so this is ideally what I would like to see for all future assessments is that the partner came back and said how they responded to the assessment. And the reason why this is good is that there might be things here that cannot be um, responded to at the time the plan is submitted for good reasons. And then you can agree between us and the implementing partner when that is going to be uh, done. And maybe in some cases, uh, hopefully unusually, but maybe in some cases it can never be done, but then it, that is agreed and documented. Because one of the problems we have when uh, we come at, to the end of the program and look at what's happened, it's not been documented when things have been agreed to not meet uh, standards, for example. So in an ideal world, you get a response and you can document and agree uh, that it will be updated in the next annual plan because uh, MEL, MEL plans should be updated annually. Uh, context changes, program logics need to be adapted. So this is a, a live document that uh, investment managers should engage with. So now I'm going to hand over to Dave to talk about uh, strengths and opportunities in terms of using the plans. Yeah, so if we just go to the next slide, um, we've just put together some ideas here, some sort of reflections on, you know, what, what appears to be working well with the standards and uh, areas where you know, there are limitations or or risks. Um, this is really just a discussion starter. You know, there's quite a few people on the call, I think, who have uh, very practical experience with how these standards are being used. So really interested to hear, you know, whether this resonates or what other views people have. Um, the uh, obvious, uh, you know, main strength is that they provide, you know, a, a level of shared understanding, shared terminology, which is a 
useful, I think, in international development where you can get a fair diver- level of diversity of practice. And, you know, as we all know, evaluation is a, a very broad discipline too. So there's a, there's a combination of those two sources of diversity. Um, but, you know, on a practical level, uh, when I or uh, other Clear Horizon staff are working as the part of a MEL team within an within an investment, within an implementing partner, uh, you know, often a, a new program are we starting, bringing together a team that hasn't worked together before or coming from, from different backgrounds. And it can be useful to have the standards as a bit of a starting point uh, to, to build a bit of um, that shared understanding and consistency. I think also at, at the sort of policy level, you know, like uh, there's an interesting discussion going on now around impact evaluation uh, and uh, the role of RCTs uh, in the mix of, of evaluation methods in the Australian government. I think, you know, within DFAT, it's really helpful for that dialogue to be situated within a, the, a sort of the foundation, really, that these standards can provide because the standards are relatively agnostic around methods and just emphasize uh, fitness for purpose. So it's, they, they provide a bit of a solid grounding, I think, that you can, um, that can support those debates. Um, yeah, they obviously have a, a key role to play in helping DFAT staff to get across their role and, and perform their role. But that really, um, uh, you know, that kind of strength is much more likely to to manifest if these other sources of support to DFAT staff, I think, are in place that we we talked about earlier, like training or coaching or, you know, support from someone like Sophia internally uh, to help them uh, work through the process. And, um, you know, just from the perspective of a an evaluator or a male practitioner, uh, it's the the standards empower you really to um, to build buy-in within say an implementing team or if, if you're part of an evaluation team to uh, to get everyone on the same page about you know the importance of methodology in the evaluation process so um, yeah, it's sort of like a a way to empower mel advisors or or evaluators as part of of broader teams um, do you want to add anything on that slide Sophia Oh, you're muted, sorry. The classic problem. Uh, just to add that when I work with staff and contractors, everyone really likes to have that framework, that it's sort of, it's not the opinions of people. And especially because there is quite a staff churn on the DFAT side, that you have some a framework that people can discuss from, uh, which seem to be very much liked by both sides. Over. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this is, uh, yeah, the flip side, limitations and risks. And again, you know, just questions here to get a conversation happening. Um, there, it's obviously quite a dense document, so it can be overwhelming which can lead uh, people unlike us who <laughs> engage with that detail to disengage um, or for Mel to be seen as too heavy, particularly if they are treated as a, a checklist. Um, and, you know, there's an interesting point here to be made about how accessible the standards are for um, staff for whom English is, if English isn't your second language, then this can be quite a dead, dense and difficult document to get across. Um, it's actually interesting that this, like say over the last you know, five or, or 10 years even, there's been a lot of streamlining of, of um, aid management processes within DFAT uh, and yet these standards have survived that and in some ways have become uh, more detailed, which I think probably points to you know their value, particularly to to implementing partners, but do you have a, a perspective on that, Sophia? So you mean uh, because the of capability within? Yeah, it's the... just interesting that uh, a lot of other 
guidelines and processes have been simplified and streamlined over the last few years, but the standards have have withstood that. Uh, it's just an interesting reflection, yeah. I guess. Well, I think when we refreshed the standards uh, and then uh, because of COVID, it took a bit longer before they were actually published between having had that brain's trust and people within DFAT, including some of my bosses said, oh, there's so many standards, so many numbers. But if you make it to, if you streamline it and, and remove it, I think sometimes it becomes more difficult actually. Mm. because then you have to do a lot of elements within each yeah. uh, sentence. So yeah. sometimes longer is, in a weird way, easier. Mm. Well, maybe it's maybe yeah, it's that's that you've reason. been able to argue for that specificity. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the second question is just whether they are to or that they can uh, encourage, I guess, compliance-oriented approach. And this is all comes down to how they're used. But as I think Sophia flagged earlier, there is a risk that um, the, the focus becomes too much on the document and not enough on how the document is used. Um, there's also a point here, you know, it, Sophia's mentioned a few times that it, they shouldn't be seen as a checklist, but I think that's still a work in progress and so uh, you know you do come across situations where um, the application of the standards is a bit context blind in that you know, there's an expectation that they should be treated like a checklist and I think that you know the um, uh, taking a more tailored approach requires a certain level of confidence or experience with with using the standards so that's you know it's probably not surprising. Uh, yeah, what about performance culture? Most of the standards are focused on the technical quality of MEL processes. There are some important exceptions, um, but you know sometimes they get lost in the the focus on on the more technical aspects of MEL. Uh, and yeah, it's probably also fair to say that they are heavily focused on the responsibilities of implementing partners, but also working level DFAT staff. And there's not much in there about the role of DFAT senior managers. And yet we know that that's obviously a, a critical underpinning to whether Mel actually you know, has much impact. Um, these sort of themes were picked up quite well in the ODE evaluation of investment level M&E, which Sophia mentioned earlier. And that's available online and is worth a read. The other critique, uh, that you hear sometimes is that they, the standards kind of take the focus away from the main game, which is strengthening MEL systems within partner countries, counterpart MEL systems. Um, and the standards are actually, you know, there are a couple of uh, standards in there that mention or that require um, the use of counterpart MEL systems or alignment with counterpart MEL systems, but, um, but yeah, it's probably. I, I think this this critique is still still uh, fairly reasonable. Anything you want to add, Sophia? Yeah, I think the it is interesting with the strengthening counterpart mail systems because that is uh, if you go back and look at the the standard for design, you have to. Uh, really look at gov or partner systems and see how they can be used. Uh, and I think there are many it, it sort of problems. One of them is that because we are using uh, Australian taxpayers' money, so we are accountable to Australians, but we are working in a sovereign country, uh, which then there might be I, an example was when I was working on a program where we, uh, it was a multilateral organization that was responsible to help the government to build their systems, but they were not very good at it. And meanwhile, we had to sit and sort of wait then, uh, and then you're accountable to your government and your people. So it can become quite tense in terms of getting that data. The other issue is that uh, one of the things that comes up a lot is that, oh, we're going to have a mail system and then 
yeah, let's just build a bit of capacity for the government partners as an afterthought. So one of the things that I'm trying to emphasize is that if that is going to be part of our design, it has to be resourced and also monitored so that it happens. Because it sort of comes like we're going to build capacity as we run along here kind of language. And, and that's also a risk, I think. Yeah. Over. OK. Uh, do you want to take us through the next slide, Sophia, on how to get the most out of the standards? Thank you. So I think one of the important things is that uh, the standards, uh, and I am completely biased, but the standards are good and it's a really useful tool, but it will also require uh, continuous training and coaching, uh, networking and sort of managing knowledge so that uh, investment managers know about them and, and can use them as Dave said, without treating it as a checklist. And that, that's uh, obviously a, a building that capability is uh, a long-term endeavor. Uh, and it is, what I find is that in everything, the more you know, the more flexibility you dare to have. So that's um, looking at the context and what's actually needed. It sort of comes back to when you see uh, you know, investments with a massive amount of indicators because maybe something will stick rather than banking on three that are actually the three right ones. So it's having that confidence and uh, really the, emphasizing again the dialogue and the partnership because four DFAT uh, investment managers do not have to be m &E experts so it's a bit onerous on uh, so the implementing partners to make sure that the DFAT person actually can understand the MEL system and, and what's going on. So that's important. And then uh, the, the culture, the performance culture is very important. And when I do training now uh, within DFAT, we always have a discussion about the performance culture within DFAT. And it varies a lot between different areas. And it's no surprise to anyone that it comes down a lot to uh, leadership and what they are, how they allow performance culture, and especially to bring up things that are not working well, so we can really learn from that. And uh, the first time Penny Wong came to visit DFAT, uh, the thing obviously that stuck with me was that she said, I'm very happy to learn from mistakes. I don't know if, uh, if that's true, but that's what she said. So that was, that's, that's, that's a good, good scene for that. The, the other thing just to throw in there, Sophia, on, um, on tailoring to context is the, um, you know, the need for, culturally responsive or culturally yes. competent approaches to Mel. And um, that's, uh, I guess that's, that's an, let's, I don't think the standards are incompatible with that, but, um, but they don't, you know, they probably could do more to, to promote that. Um, and, you know, maybe that's something uh, to think about going forward. Yeah. And, and I think that that comes back to even the debate that we're having right now, with methods for impact evaluations, because it's also how comfortable uh, people are with methods they are not familiar with, or they, it, it, because from DFAT's horizon, if it's rigorous uh, methods that gets credible information, it's all good. But it's sort of having the confidence and, and understanding, even by male experts, if, if they uh, can promote that and, and um, implement it. So that is, I agree, that is definitely something that we need to think more about. And I think also the other thing is, uh, you might have noticed if, if uh, you paid attention that we are now talking about MEL in DFAT rather than m and &E. And if you're an m and &E person like myself, the L, the learning is always front and center. But I think 
words matter. So it's really good that we are adding the L now so that it is really a lot more focus on, on learning and sharing the learning from evaluations across uh, DFAT and beyond. So that I think is also really important. I think next slide. So where to from here? So we, we are very aware because you could say that Dave and I are working on, on two sides here with, with the same tools and it's not a quick fix. Uh, as I said, we've, I've been sort of involved with this for over 15 years and uh, the really good and encouraging thing is that I can see improvement. It has become a lot better than 15 years ago, but of course it's still a long way to go. It's sort of like two steps forward, one back, but that means that we are moving forward. And um, the other thing is for me within DFAT as an organization is to really get staff to engage with MEL and not see it as something someone else is doing on the side. And sometimes when you talk to uh, MEL experts, they also have that challenge within the contractor because in the standard now, we are emphasizing that MEL is the responsibility of senior management. So to engage people to actually have good user-friendly MEL systems is uh, a key. And then it is a challenge with capability, which I'm defining, defining as having the knowledge to do things and then capacity, having the time to actually do it uh, or the resources to do it. And uh, both those are, uh, I think, uh, within DFAT, depending on the areas, they are both um, weak. But I think also that uh, sometimes we think in DFAT that there is a, an abundance of capability and capacity outside of DFAT, but that's not actually true. We need more male people in this world. So I'm very happy to see all of you here on the screen and spread the word.